Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Monday morning. Where else could we be here on ThinkTech? I'm Jay Fidel talking about community matters with Stephen Auerbach. Uh, he's with UH. He's the what, interim director of the Office of um, Innovation and Commercialization. Commercialization, you know, which is something that ThinkTech has followed a long, long time, 20 years anyway. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh... Well, this is, I think it's an important discussion. I'll tell you why. Um, because, you know, Hawaii, and there's some people who, you know, push against this. Hawaii's future is intertwined with technology, with innovation, um, with entrepreneurship, commercialization. Whether we like it or not, we need to do that. We have needed to do it for a long time. Now, there were bursts of light back in the aught years, you know. Um, and there was Act 221, uh, Rested Soul. And there were all these people who came from the mainland to do coding and get involved in startups and the like. Since then, it has declined. But your office still exists. And the Office of Transfer, Technology Transfer, and all that still exists, still, still operating. And uh, you have a great future in front of you running it, I must say. Um, this is a very enviable situation because Soon enough, we're going to find out that what what Jack Burns said and uh, George Arioshi said and John Whitehays, all those governors all along the way, they always said the same thing: we have to we have to get into diversification. And so you're the diversification man. So tell us what what is the office? Um, what is its range? Its its mission? Its activities? Um, tell us why it should attract a lot of money from the legislature and the university. Tell us. No, that's great. Uh, great tee up. You know, the university is a world class, uh, what we call an R1 research uh, university. And you've had others on the show. And, and fortunately, with the world class researchers, faculty, students, and staff, we're able to track uh, 450 million or so in extramural funds. So that's federal, state, uh, private uh, funds that help uh, drive uh, economic development, workforce development for our state. And you know, within the Office of Innovation and Commercialization, which I have the privilege and, and honor of uh, playing in since returning home, is really all about how do we drive innovation entrepreneurship. And it's not just new technology and widgets, it's also the culture and, and really the awareness and understanding of the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship for uh, our community to drive not only societal impact, but economic development and workforce development day. So how, how do you do that? How you do that in an effective way so that it actually happens? I mean, I see you as the, forgive me, but the hub, okay, in the wheel. And you have spokes going out in all the directions and you're trying to make connections and collaborations, bring people in, bring programmers, uh, researchers uh, from all parts of the tech tech and scientific world um, and connect them up, connect them up with others here and elsewhere, connect them up with money somehow, connect them up with buyers and acquirers yeah. and what have you. And, you know, just build a lot of activity. Action is what we're talking about. The more the merrier. Now we haven't really achieved that yet, but you know, you're, you're the hub, you're the hub in that wheel. So what are the spokes and what are you doing to reach all those all those points around the wheel. Yeah, no, good. Uh, and you know, there's no one silver bullet, as you would know. Um, we've certainly transitioned from sugarcane and pineapple. Uh, we've got tourism, military that's vibrant. Um, and now we're in the fourth industrial revolution, which is the era of automation, technology, uh, machine learning, AI, IoT. And so our office really is, our, our mission is, to, is focused on, you know, building partnerships between UH, the community, the world, um, and strategically advancing discoveries and inspiring researchers, uh, innovators, and entrepreneurs to create new opportunities for Hawaii and beyond. And, and like I said in the onset, uh, this is a key asset within the University of Hawaii. Uh, we sit within the office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation. Uh, that organization is led by VP, Silas Sermos. Um, and within our office, it's really about bridging those connections, Jay. And, you know, more specifically, we're fanatically focused on working to create more high quality jobs, uh, diversify our Hawaii's economy. You hear everybody talking about that. 
uh, research, education, and training opportunities for our local communities. Um, and you know, it's it's really about uh, what I'd like to say. You know, I said there's no silver bullet, but how do we create a sustainable economic activity that's fit for Hawaii, right? Um, and in doing so, we've got to consider uh, both our internal needs as well as the, the goods and services required within Hawaii. And then absolutely necess necessary for us is to develop additional robust traded sectors that bring in external revenue to the state. And so to answer your question specifically, we work with the world-class researchers, whether it's out of astronomy, ocean sciences, college of tropical agriculture, engineering, computer sciences, uh, ocean sciences, creative media, and we partner with the researchers so they fully understand the technology and the research they're doing not only has societal impact, but potentially economic impact with the ability to actually commercialize their research and their technology. And so our office has the traditional tech transfer uh, 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 assets where we work on NDAs, MTAs, so non-disclosure agreements, material trans transfer agreements, uh, licensing agreements to help commercialize that world-class research. Uh, whether that's a startup, that's a spin out, a licensing arrangement, uh, that's all part of what our tech transfer. And then the other asset within the office, uh, we also have UH Ventures. Uh, within UH Ventures, and uh, I think you're aware of this one, Jay, you've got Act 38 and Act 39. Uh, that was approved by the ledge. Uh, Act 38 allows us to bring some of the conflicts of interest and manage those internally. Gives a little more flexibility and take more risk. Act 39 allows us to bring money in, federal, private, philanthropy, so we can re reinvest that money back to try and diversify our economy. So that's a little bit about how uh, our office is structured. We did bring on another uh, key component, uh, the Office of Indigenous Innovation. And really trying to bring in the best practices, cultures, and values of uh, Aina and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. no. That sounds like the full panoply of the university there. Um, so a couple of questions that spring out of that, though. Uh, what about patents? Uh, there was a time when uh, OTED uh, would actually fund uh, patent applications. Are you still doing that? Yeah, no, good question. So if you have a researcher that's uh, gotten some extramural fundings from uh, National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health or Department of Energy. Uh, and if they're coming up with a, dis they disclose their technology to our office, we'll review that for applicability and uniqueness and then make a determination if we're going to file a, provision, a non provisional patent or a provisional patent and then spend the money to do that. I always wish we had more money to spend on uh, filing the patents because patents are key uh, to drive technology and, and innovation and, and diversification. We have a limited budget, right? And so we're constrained and we do a very good job. The team is very focused on what are the key technologies that we think are differentiated, unique enough that align to our core franchises here that I talked about within the University of Hawaii. So I, if I come to you with a good idea, you know, uh, who knows what, say a device of some kind. And in fact, we, we talk to people around the university who are working on these things all day long. And, and um, I come to you and I say, look, you know, I, I think I need to protect this or I'm gonna lose it. Somebody's gonna knock, you know, knock it off. So can you fund a provisional patent application for me? Which isn't cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than the utility patent application. Um, so how far can you go? How much can you spend? And do you have lawyers in your, you know, in your, in your pipeline there, in your bullpen, where you can you know, drag them onto the field and say, here, Get, get a patent for this guy. Can you do that? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, hypothetically, you say I mean, you have you have that new technology. If you're a faculty, student, staff, I'm saying, hey, Jay, let's continue having conversation. Do the disclosure to really find out the uniqueness of that technology or that invention. And then we do have uh, very talented uh, staff. We have a couple of attorneys on our bench, uh, actually patent uh, attorneys as well. Uh, and then we'll review that for, like I said, uniqueness and applicability uh, based on the technologies and the research we're doing here. And then um, the, the way we typically work it is we either will front the money and then recover it based on any licensing royalties that we recoup, uh, or the research or faculty may front the money on their end uh, and fund it, uh, depending on if they have a startup or if they wanna go that route. Uh, and then we evaluate those technology, those disclosures and determine how far we wanna continue, whether it's US, rest of the world, Asia Pacific, Europe, uh, and file in those countries as well. 
And that allows us, as you know, with the way patents work, allows us to really leapfrog and step function the technology at the next level. So you mentioned funding a few minutes ago, and I'm interested in that too. Um, first of all, you know, there, there is a sort of a template deal between the university and, and the entrepreneur, the researcher, who wants to commercialize his uh, idea. Um, and I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but let's say for this discussion, it was like half-half or something like that, where the university kept half of the, you know, the benefit, the ownership of the project, and the researcher kept the other half, and the university funded the, you know, the researcher in going down that line you described. Is it still that way? What is it like? If I come to you and I, you know, and I present my idea, uh, are we going to get into a partnership? And what terms would that be? Yeah, and it depends on the bargaining unit, whether you're your faculty, uh, staff, uh, and or student that doesn't have a bargaining unit, then there's different uh, uh, variations. But yeah, there is a, a collaborative effort that we put together and we put together agreements uh, and share. Uh, typically, the any royalties or monies that re is received from said technology that may have a patent, uh, a percentage goes to the uh, inventor. Uh, typically, the, the money follows and the, the, the follows the inventor. Um, there all is a small portion that also goes to the university, and then a small portion that goes to the unit. So, for example, if the School of Ocean and Earth Sciences tech, uh, does an uh, invention from one of their faculty, a portion goes back and helps fund. And the, the unique thing about that is it enables that researcher in that unit, astronomy, so as engineering, to continue doing some more innovation and in, in incubating. Uh, so some monies flow uh, to those three entities. Can I, can I do a case study with you actually, Steve? <clears throat> I, uh, I, I don't wanna surprise you, but I would like to discuss some case, some company, some entrepreneur. Is this, is this hypothetical or is this a no, historical? This is real. Or? This is real. So you, know, you and so don't go too far back because I just came back home uh, five years. So I don't have a lot of historical perspective. Born and raised here, but uh, I haven't worked in academia and tech transfer office. This is my first run at it. I was I come out of tech, so uh, don't go too far back in history. <laughs> well, you also took your graduate degrees here at UH. Yeah. So, <laughs> so no, I mean, is it what's cooking? You know, uh, like I remember, for example, Digital Island. This is way back. This is way back before I was born too. This is back in the 90s. Um, and there was a guy um, who had some technology, I think with telecom, and he approached the state at the time there was some money in the state for this sort of thing. <clears throat> and the state invested in his company um, and it went public. You know, this is in the 90s, it went public. And, um, and then the state immediately sold its interest out and made some money, but not nearly as much money the guy's name was Ron Higgins, um, as Ron Higgins made. And so it was good, but not great, uh, because the state you know, had the ability, had the, whatever you want to call it, the, the moxie to invest in his company, actually invest in his company for a share of his company. But it didn't have the mm, sustainability, it didn't have the stick to to stay in there for a little longer, where it would have made mm, as much money as Higgins made. Um, but I, I don't know, that kind of sexy deal happening, is there anything going on that you can talk about? Yeah, there, there is, uh, and that's thanks for that historical perspective. And, and we have not had a home run and it's not, we're gonna looking for a home run. We're looking for many around the, around the basis, right? Across all those sectors I talked about. Uh, we're seeing some interesting stuff in, the, in agriculture uh, around macadamia nuts. We're seeing some interesting stuff around uh, COVID and, and testing and, and vaccines. We're seeing some interesting stuff around space and satellites. I know you've had people on your show talking about that. We're seeing some interesting stuff come out of the engineering school around AI and machine learning. We're seeing interesting stuff around data sciences out of our data sciences institute. Uh, we're seeing interesting stuff out of astronomy and the list goes on, right? Um, yeah. But what's cool about that, Jay, is we've got a very, that's what's good about University of Hawaii that people don't recognize and realize and appreciate. It is a R1 world-class, and we have world-class researchers working on all different areas. We just we gotta figure out how to be a little more vocal and transparent and show up and share some of this technology at the same time, commercialize it, right? Yeah. And whether it's a small company that's looking to acquire and commercialize that technology or a large company, I can't talk about those large companies we're having conversations with, but they do exist, right? 
not every deal is going to get across the finish line and be a home run, like I said. No, but along the way, what we're doing is building this culture and this awareness and appreciation of actually building stuff. And when you build stuff and develop patents, guess, and people show up, guess what? That drives diversification. That drives that kind of that attitude. And what better time, COVID, to do this kind of stuff? Well, so I'm so excited about it. COVID is making us rethink our economy and certainly making us rethink diversification. And that, you know, that's, that's uh, I firmly believe this is, this is the best opportunity in a long time. You're, you're in a great spot because people are sensitive to this whole idea about diversification. But let's, let's talk a little about, um, you know, these, these um, incubators, uh, uh, Blue Planet, uh, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Elemental. Elemental. And yeah. Uh, are you are you in with them? Are they providing possibilities to you? Are you providing possibilities to them? Are they giving you money? So there's no money exchange, um, but it's a vibrant ecosystem, and we all need to show up and play together and collaborate. And I, we do. We, there's a good relationship. And so I'll give you a, 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 a an example or a use case. So you could have some of this world class technology that's coming out of UH. And that's not enough of this is happening. I want to change that trajectory that they're going through the commercialization process uh, and they may go through uh, some of the great stuff that's happening out at Shither and the Pace with the uh, Lee Startup and Summer Launchpad and just getting the interest and vibe around innovation entrepreneurship. Or they may be a world-class researcher that has a spin out and they're doing some technology. What better way than in our own backyard to then transition to Elemental or Blue Startups? And we do have cases where some of our researchers or faculty, students or staff and their, their teams are showing up in those accelerators. And then it happens to be in Hawaii, right? And, and then you start getting into phase one, phase two, phase three of potential federal monies, uh, SBIR, uh, small business investment, STTR, those types of monies that can then continue to invest in, in nurture the research and get them to commercialize, commercialization efforts. So it's absolutely dialed into the ecosystem partners. We're very strong uh, connection uh, together. And we cannot do it solely alone. We've got to do it together as a whole. I call it whole of the community. Yeah, we had a, we had a show with a fellow uh, who got some, he got some substantial uh, SBIR money recently. And uh, he's working on sensors uh, that are going into um, satellites and the like and um, various other, you know, high tech electronics. Uh, and it's he's a, not, go ahead. He's a good friend. He saw, right? Yeah. Not a scientific. Yes, right. Um, and you know, it's it's not a university project, but somehow it's it's connected. So that my question is, and here you have uh, an LLC. It's separate, uh, and you know, it sounds to me like, in terms of funding, he's doing pretty well in his space, and he's likely to do more and better later. Um, but query, what what is the university's support of him? What is the university's connection? What is your support and connection with? with that kind of, uh, what do you call it, spinoff? Yeah, so he, he's a, a PhD from the University of Hawaii, came out of physics, very, very bright guy. And he's found a niche around these sensors. Uh, and he's using CMOS and, and uh, technology, you know, uh, uh, wafer technology to put in the satellites. And so he'll actually work with some of our postdocs and researchers, hire them based on the SBI or STTR money that he's bringing in to continue to evolve his research we're having conversations that I can't go into detail about right now on this, this show, but how do we continue to develop that relationship to the next level? Um, there could be spin outs or spin outs from the technology he's doing. He's very focused, which is the right thing to do around his unique uh, technology. But from a workforce development standpoint, bringing our, our students and researchers to work with him on some of this technology is another one. How do we bring in some of the other folks from physics or engineering, which he's got strong relationships with, so they start thinking about innovation entrepreneurship so they can do a spin out. So it's kind of what I call a ripple effect just by that one novel scientific leading the way, Isar, and he's a doer. He's got a good, great attitude to drive innovation entrepreneurship in a strong yeah, way. Yeah. A tremendous guy. It was really good yeah. to talk to him. Um, you know, and, and all of these other areas you mentioned are so ripe for, with possibility for Hawaii. And Hawaii does have smart guys like Isar. Uh, you know, who can, you know, push to the frontier, except in one area. Well, what's, what's that one area, Jay? Astronomy. 
Okay, and the reason I say that is, is for you know a, a piece of discussion here. Astronomy, there's resistance on astronomy. There are people who think you know astronomy is not important. Um, and they have other agendas and they fight even, even now, even now they fight against astronomy. Um, and I say to myself, this, this goes to the kind of thing you're doing with Waipahu High School. This, this, this is the kind of thing you have to get into the minds of local kids early. You have to show them it's, it's not just, um, you know, it's, it's not just unattainable, it's attainable. Uh, you know, some of the best scientists I have met from the state of Hawaii are from Hilo. I cannot understand that. They come in legions to the science fair for years. What is it about Hilo? It's a few good teachers. That's what it is. And, and so if we had that kind of connection, and I know that Waipahu has some great science teachers. Waipahu, you must be familiar with all of them. Um, and so the question is, um, how do you build a culture? where kids in this state and thus soon enough adults in this state will embrace science. You know, we have a national problem about embracing science right now. Hawaii has to be way ahead of that. How do we embrace science and get our kids to believe in it? Yeah, great question. You know, I'm a Kalani Falcon graduate. I'm not gonna give you the year. I did not learn, I wish I had learned this early on. And this is something when people ask me to talk or come and uh, give back in the community, we need to start this early, right? It's middle school with STEM. It's high school with STEM and innovation entrepreneurship or design thinking. It does not happen. For me, it happened uh, early mid-career at Hewlett Packard. I was forced to do it because we were facing significant headwinds and our business was tanking. It was a burning platform. So we brought in Steve Blank, Guy Kawasaki and others and we started learning about this lean startup methodology. Back then we were doing all waterfall software development. We had to pivot and shift to agile. So almost too late for me when I started vibing on innovation entrepreneurship. So your point, if we can start earlier and talking to them about innovation entrepreneurship, and there's a lot of folks that like to build stuff. If you're building Legos, that's a great start. You're building something. If you like to plant Palo, you're building something. You're building a farm. If you like to you know, uh, work on cooking and, and culinary or designing homes, that's building stuff, right? That's that, you know, skill set that I really want to try and nurture at the early, earlier age. And here's a fascinating thing. There's a handful of schools that we're working with. They have entrepreneurship clubs. Imagine that entrepreneurship club, if they find out UH, which we do have entrepreneurship clubs, right? If I can graduate from that high school, stay in Hawaii as part of my community, join the entrepreneurship club, and I may have had an idea, a widget or a service or a product that I thought of in high school, now I can go into the world-class four-year university, University of Hawaii, or if you want to go to a two-year co college, community college, same thing, learning this stuff, because that's another topic I'm, I, I'm pretty passionate about where innovation entrepreneurship exists. But now you come to UH, you go to the entrepreneurship club, you take advantage of all the world-class assets we have here, surround yourself with world-class researchers, continue to incubate your idea. Imagine if we were to get funding and scholarships some of those students, so they stay in Hawaii, stay at UH and do innovation entrepreneurship. Big thing, right? Absolutely. So, have you seen uh, have you seen the serial on, on Netflix? Um, gee, I hope you have. It would be great if you have. Um, called uh, "Halt and Catch Fire." No, I haven't. This, this is fabulous. It's a serial. It's got two or three seasons to it, and it's about um, it's about this whole thing about entrepreneurship back in the early '80s when computers were just getting started. And when you know guys work for IBM and they split off IBM and they come and they form, you know, their their tiny little company and and make a computer that competes with IBM. This happened again and again and again, and, and they fail a lot of the time, but they learned and they filtered into the industry in general. Before you know it, they they populated companies that you know made them richer than your wildest dreams. And uh, it's the whole story of that. And it's not, it's not a documentary, it's fiction, but, but it picks up on all this technology you're talking about and all that entrepreneurial, what do you want to call it, essence, that entrepreneurial drive that you need to have. It's not only knowledge, it's something inside in your gut that makes you work till two in the morning, that kind yeah. of thing, you know? And yeah. so I tell you a short story here. Here, we always are looking for new software. We found, we thought we were a video company, nah. 
we're a software company, we use software, software consumers and adapters and integrators. That's what we do. And, and, and we, can't, we can't really do the job without the software. And then I suggest, and I'm sure people have said this to you for years, that you know, you take any company, any operating company, and bring a software guy in there and make it better. Change it completely and make it sing and dance. Um, and so we always looking for software like that. So I was looking for specialized <coughs> software and, and I think I found it, okay, in Istanbul. I'm not kidding. Really? In Istanbul, they, right, they get, on, they get on my machine with Team Viewer. Uh, they help me install it and configure it. And from Istanbul, they do this. Well, I heard a lot of coming out of Israel. I haven't much coming out of Istanbul. Anyway, keep going. Well, point, you know, and, and, I, and the competitors uh, were in Serbia, um, or in Moscow, um, and there were others too in odd places. Point is, it's global, okay? Yeah. And, 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 and these guys are really no better qualified than we could be. We could be another Istanbul. <laughs> so my question to you is, if I'm looking for software that's exotic, you know, that's well thought out, that's really clever. Can I find it here? And can I find it here now? And if not now, then when? And how? Yeah, no, that's a good story. And, and my, we, I know a lot of stuff have coming out of Israel. I hadn't heard about Istanbul. But out of our computer science department, uh, out of our engin computer engineering department, people are working on, on software, uh, different use cases, right? Uh, there's uh, Dr. Jason Lay, who we believe who we're going to have on the innovation of the new normal, which I got to talk to you about still. Uh, he's going to be, he has uh, some good software uh, uh, students and, and researchers working on some software. So yeah, there are pockets of it here. I'd like to see more, especially as AI continues to uh, kind of rule going forward. And with the fourth industrial revolution that I talked about, I'd like to see more. I, I think we could do more here in Hawaii. Okay, now you've done a great segue, actually, Steve, into the conference coming up soon. Um, the uh, what call it, innovation conference you're setting up at UH. Tell me, what is it? Who's going to be there? When is it? And so forth. No, thanks. Thanks, Jay. This is a uh, pretty cool. It's back to uh, this whole culture of innovation entrepreneurship. And so we're going to really show up is what I call it. It's called Innovations for the New Normal. So next week, uh, November 9, 10, 12, and 13, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, we skip Wednesday, for about two hours every morning, 8 a.m. to about 9.30 or 10, there's going to be four days of jam-packed research innovation uh, topics. Day one, or session one, on the 9th, we're going to have President Lasner, he's going to open up. We have uh, Nainoa Thompson, is going to be a keynote, Navigating Times of Change. And then we jump right into this topic around resilient food systems in the COVID era. Uh, and so this is a free conference. People can jump, uh, dial in for one or more of the sessions. Uh, day two, uh, Jay, if I could keep going on day two, because I'm excited about this stuff. We go not only from resilient food systems, but now we're going into uh, innovations in healthcare. And so we have Dr. Amy Grace. I don't know if you've had her on your show. If not, we got to get her on. But she is a local girl, a Stanford doctor, and she's leading our health initiative here at the university. And she's bringing a dynamite panel of folks coming around to talk about uh, Hawaii pre-pandemic, uh, innovative ways that UH and the health community in Hawaii have worked together to expand uh, virtual care going forward. And then session three, I have the opportunity to tee up a good friend of mine, uh, Steve Blank. And so this is uh, the Thursday, uh, 8 a.m., and I'll do an Oceanside chat with uh, Steve Blank. We're going to talk about creating new businesses and reinventing existing ones. And then I go into a panel. I've got uh, Creighton Narita. He's the CEO of EK and uh, Team Praxis. I got Peter Dames. He's the EVP over at Servco. I have Chris Lee, who's the director of the Academy of Creative Media. I have Dr. Jason Lee I talked about earlier. And then Captain Kurt Moll from NSA Hawaii. And then Jay, bring it home. Friday, last day, culminating event. We actually have Guy Kawasaki. I talked about him before. He's coming in. He's going to do a 10-minute uh, how to be a remarkable inventor. And if you have not talked to, uh, talked with Guy or heard from Guy, local boy, Ilani grad, dynamite speaker. Dynamite, so, dynamite speaker. I've, I've seen him a number of times. He's terrific. And he's, he's picked up surfing, so he's going to maybe talk a little bit about his surfing fun. And then Vasilis <laughs> closes it out on uh, with uh, President Lasner and 
uh, Rich Wacker and some other key leaders uh, and around the path forward for Hawaii uh, going forward. So that's it in a summary. I know we're running out of time, but I hope folks tune in. It's, uh, we're, we're capping at a thousand registrants. It's free. Uh, last week I heard we're over 400 plus that have already signed up. So if your listeners are out there, please sign in. It's free. It's great, great topics. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad you mentioned that. So where do I go? So the link is hawaii.edu forward slash research forward slash innovations dash for dash the dash new dash normal. Okay, for the new normal. All right, thank you, Steve. It's great to talk to you. Uh, and I look forward to more discussion. I look forward to at least seeing part of that huge magnificent, ambitious program you're setting up. Uh, this is what we need to do and you're doing it. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, Jay, let me, just one final thing I want to say. Thank you for, you know, allowing me to show up and be here. You do so much for the community. Uh, I've only been back home for four or five years, four plus years now, and I've tuned in. Uh, keep up the great work because this is important stuff for our community uh, and for societal and economic impact. And thanks to you for doing this kind of stuff. Thank you, Steve. All the best. Aloha. Stay safe. All right. Aloha.